good afternoon and welcome to your set live lectures dear friends today in political science we will try to understand the concept of constitutionalism and democracy in that we will try to understand how the different models of constitutionalism and democracy that is anglo saxon uh, continental and commonwealth models we will also try to see the tensions between the both the concepts and we will try to understand it through the british and the american models to discuss this topic we have with us our subject expert dr satish kumar jha dr jha is associate professor in department of political science at aryabhatta college university of delhi he has over 25 years of teaching experience and his area of expertise lies in political theory and indian political thought Without further ado, I would like to welcome sir to our studios and request him to start the lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Amrit. Good afternoon. Uh, today's lecture uh, we are going to devote on a topic uh, which is very important from the point of view of political science uh, as a whole, but particularly from the point of view of comparative government and political theory. Uh, in fact, uh, this topic that is constitutionalism and democracy. Uh, is uh, one uh, area one uh, theme uh, which combines the resources of uh, political theory as well as uh, the institutional uh, design and the theories around uh, which you know the political institutions have evolved over the ages though at the very outset uh, one should remember one uh, important uh, thing related to this discussion that this uh, you know relationship between constitutionalism and democracy uh, is fraught with a lot of uh, you know controversies and lot of tensions because uh, you know on the face of it it appears that constitutionalism and democracy have natural affinity with each other to some extent it is also true but at the same time we should also remember that where democracy stands for Uh, people's will, people's power, the raw power of the masses. Uh, constitutionalism stands for limited government, checkmating that raw power of the people. So, therefore, constitutionalism is essentially a kind of uh, check on the power of the people, uh, because you know raw power uh, can turn into majoritarianism, can turn into mobocracy, uh, and some of the reasons due to which. the ancient greek philosophers and thinkers uh, showed a strong reservation uh, you know for democracy and uh, now this uh, you know evolution of the two ideas uh, that is democracy and constitutionalism have been very interesting from the very beginning uh, in fact constitutionalism of course uh, is at times considered to be a modern phenomenon uh, though in fact uh, we shouldn't forget that even in ancient and medieval times uh, there were many attempts uh, to basically uh, reflect on this issue of constitution and constitutionalism uh, though in modern times of course uh, it has been uh, you know it, it has got institutionalized uh, it has acquired uh, a status of a common sense in terms of uh, you know political process and political uh, you know ideas uh, but nonetheless uh, the attempt to uh, theorize uh institutions attempt to uh, you know reflect on law and government uh, is not uh, essentially a modern uh, you know phenomenon because even in ancient time we find that uh, thinker like aristotle uh, reflected on this issue uh, at great length and therefore uh, you know it is not just for nothing that he studied 158 constitutions and did a comparative study and classified them and uh, you know gave his own opinion that what should be the ideal form of government ideal form of constitution and so on and so forth so it is a, you know ancient uh, uh, you know to some extent one can say the constitutionalism democracy of course uh, you know the form has changed uh, the nature has changed uh, but nonetheless uh, one should not forget uh, that uh, you know democracy is also a very ancient uh, in its origin in terms of ideas even india Uh, in fact uh, many of us would remember uh, that india had a uh, republican uh, system of government of course it was superseded by monarchies and then for uh, you know for a long period in history in india didn't have uh, much democratic uh, you know experimentation until uh, modern times particularly after you know the colonial rule and so on and so forth similarly in west also you find that democracy also has a very uh you know uh, 
long history uh, starting with uh, the Greek period uh, to Roman period and subsequently of course the medieval period was characterized by altogether different system. And again in modern period it gained momentum and uh, new currency and uh, in fact to the extent that many uh, scholars uh, you know who, who are considered authorities on democracy including C. B. Macpherson, uh, they would say that democracy is essentially uh, you know a modern uh, con construct, particularly liberal democracy is a modern construct which emerged with uh, liberalism, which emerged with industrialism, which emerged with uh, you know the market society in the west. So, therefore, you know both I concepts that is constitutionalism and democracy have a long history and uh, a long history, long process of evolution. And in modern times both of them have acquired a new form, a new meaning. So, that is something very important to remember. But you know one thing is very important here uh, to mention uh, that this evolution of democracy and constitutionalism uh, has found different you know expressions. Uh, in different geographical regions uh, and of course uh, you know ideas of course have uh, you know traveled from one part to the another and uh, therefore one cannot say that ideas are totally tied to geography uh, and ideas are limited to a geographical region rather one can say that ideas have traveled uh, there have been a very uh, fruitful and creative interaction among ideas and therefore what we find uh, that uh, you know today's constitutions which are emerging in different parts of the world uh, you know at so late uh, in uh, you know in the day what we find that all those ideas which have emerged in history in different parts of the world which have been experimented are sought to be incorporated and therefore that is the strength of ideas that they basically do not remain tied to geography, they do not remain tied to a country or uh, rather they be become you know a kind of uh, you know uh, a, 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 an idea for humanity and therefore the entire uh, human society tries to get benefit out of it. Now therefore when India was drafting its constitution uh, you know between 1946 to 1949 of course it was it came into existence in 1950. Uh, you know, it, it, it was enforced in 1950. Um, in fact, you know, Ambedkar, uh, the, you know, the chairman of the drafting committee, while, uh, you know, he was piloting the draft constitution, uh, you know, on the floor of the constituent assembly, made very uh, perceptive observation. He said that there is one criticism that Indian constitution does not uh, provide any original thinking, because rather it is a combination of all existing uh, constitutions of the world be it Britain or United States of America or some other countries. And he then he added uh, that you know there cannot be anything so innovative which will not be drawing on uh, the ideas and uh, you know sources from uh, other constitution. Because after all in human uh, society one basically learns from errors, one learns from experience, one learns from others uh, you know uh, wisdom. And therefore, he said that if Indian constitution is combining uh, ideas from different parts of the world, this is rather intended to help uh, Indian system to uh, become a kind of a model system where all the loose ends are tied and which can provide solution to India's problem. So therefore, in fact, this is something very true about constitutionalism that uh, of course, as an idea it emerges em emerge in certain parts of the world and that the two important uh, you know revolutions uh, can be cited here. Uh, the 1688 the glorious revolution in Britain and uh, American war of uh, in, you know independence of course along with the French revolution at, at level of idea uh, about democracy at the level of idea about freedom. But in fact uh, French revolution as it was superseded by uh, Napoleonic you know ex experience in history and therefore in fact American I mean the French constitutionalism uh, did not provide uh, those institutional designs which are normally considered important from the point of view of individual freedom uh, you know uh, people's rights uh, and uh, you know the limited government and so on and so forth. There are three four important hallmarks of constitutionalism. Uh, in fact one is of course rule of law. Uh, the second important hallmark is of course the freedom that how it tries to secure freedom uh, and uh, liberty of the people. Uh, the third is uh, that you know the procedural sanctity, the sanctity of the legal procedures, uh, rules and regulations. 
Therefore, that is another important hallmark along with the kind of institutional democratic institutions that they function, the kind of institutional protocol which it lays down. These are the essential hallmarks of any you know sound constitution and therefore when we say constitutionalism basically this is ideology of uh, that process. So therefore as a constitutionalism uh, you know, know when we talk of constitutionalism it becomes a kind of uh, ideology which is meant to protect individual freedom, individual autonomy, uh, you know individuals consent in authority in the formation of authority and so on and so forth. So all these things are integral part of constitution and constitutionalism. Now the tension part with the democracy is equally important uh, because you know the tension part is important uh, because you know uh, the thing is that uh, how democracy and constitutionalism come into conflict with each other because on the face of it it looks that there should not be any conflict between constitutionalism and democracy because both are essentially meant uh, for empowering people. But one thing is important that how do you empower people? Uh, people, uh, a people's will uh, is basically given a kind of a stature uh, which is unsuperseded by any other uh, similar, uh, you know, uh, process uh, where basically the raw will of the people should rule and basically that should be respected uh, without any procedural checkmates, without any procedural, uh, you know, limitation on that. This is one uh, point of view so far as democracy is concerned. But there is another point of view about democracy. That democracy, of course, the people's will is sovereign. There is no denying the fact. But the sovereign will, in order to become more meaningful for society, and even for those people whose will are ultimately, uh, you know, called sovereign, uh, it is important that that sovereign will is checkmated with the elaborate process of law, with uh, checkmated with the elaborate process of, uh, you know. With the elaborate process of uh, you know legal uh, procedure and so on and so forth. So therefore, in fact, what we find uh, that uh, uh, you know this uh, constitution uh, as as a system of laws, uh, procedures, uh, as an ideology, uh, in fact, uh, is sometimes considered very important for uh, democracy as a whole. Otherwise, democracy will remain incomplete. And it is here that we draw inspiration from political theory uh, because in political theory there are two thinkers in modern period and both are considered uh, in fact important from the point of view of democracy and constitutionalism. On the one hand you have Locke uh, who is considered to be the prophet of a limited government uh, whereas on the other hand you have Rousseau who is considered to be uh, the high priest of uh, democracy in terms of people's uh, sovereign will or basically the, the raw power of the people. So therefore, Rousseau through his concept of general will and Locke through his concept of limited government are considered to be, you know, the pioneer in uh, this, these areas that is constitutionalism and democracy. Because whatever has happened subsequently in history in modern times, particularly in area of constitutionalism has drawn heavily on the ideas of Locke, particularly his concept of limited government. And therefore, United States of America as a model is best reflection of this fact that how Locke has and his ideas have influenced the evolution of modern constitutionalism. Whereas Rousseau's concept of general will, the raw power of the people, maybe it is different matter that some people call it a tyranny of the majority, the raw, raw power of the people becomes sometimes a tyranny of the majority which is not uh, good for a liberal society which is not good for individual freedom, which is not good from the point of view of democratization of a social order. So therefore, uh, this is sometimes criticized, criticized the tyranny of the majority. In fact, the most you know, trenchant critique of this tyranny of majority came uh, through John Stuart Mill's ideas uh, about you know, the minority protection and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, from the point of view of democracy and constitutionalism, uh, you know, Locke and Rousseau can be considered as two important uh, sources of inspiration. And uh, their relationship, therefore, is very important. And whatever has happened in history subsequently, uh, be it uh, you know the American uh, system or one can say the other models which have emerged. In fact, we will come to this question, the different models of constitutionalism, that how different models can be seen today from the point of view of the evolution of 
constitutionalism. One can find you know a very powerful influence of Lockean idea on that. It is a different matter that immediate uh, you know uh, you know theoretician uh, or, or of this uh, separation of power doctrine which United States of America institutionalizes through its constitution is traced to Montesquieu, uh, you know the French uh, philosopher and political thinker Montesquieu, particularly his separation of power. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, interestingly, it is Locke uh, who first of all, uh, you know, gave this idea of separation uh, between the three organs of the government through his, uh, you know, idea of contract and limited government. So therefore, Locke and Montesquieu, two important sources from the point of view of certain institutional, uh, you know, innovations which have happened in modern time, particularly United States of America and many other countries. But there are many other sources also. For example, rule of law, as it was given by Dicey, is another important source in terms of the evolution of constitutionalism. In fact, federalism to some extent, one can say, is a great innovation in our you know, area of constitutionalism. And again here, it is United States of America which can be considered a uh, you know, site of its uh, innovation. Uh, because uh, what happened through Madisonian and Jeffersonian uh, ideas uh, through you know, that federalist paper, uh, in fact, we find another milestone being achieved in the history of the evolution of constitutionalism, that is the federalism. So separation of power, federalism, uh, you know, the way the rights have been institutionalized and constitutionalized, uh, the way the judiciary has acquired the power to review the laws, uh, you know, particularly through the doctrine of judicial review, again uh, got innovative in United States of America uh, through a very famous judgment, Marbury versus Madison judgment by uh, Chief Justice Marshall. So therefore, one can say that from time to time innovations have been made uh, in the history of ideas, particularly from the point of view of constitutionalism. And therefore, this has, uh, you know, taken a evolutionary, you know, track. And still it is evolving with new experiences, with new experiments, with new challenges. In fact, human minds tend to innovate and that applies to this area of constitutionalism. So far as democracy is concerned, uh, again, we find that lot of evolutions taking place in area of democracy. Of course, normally it is understood in terms of this bipolar, uh, you know, uh, opposites that is direct and indirect, representative and participatory. But nonetheless, within these two uh, broad, you know, uh, you know, classification, representative and the direct, or uh, you know, direct and indirect, we find that there are many finer details. There are many uh, new ideas emerging. Uh, you know, among political thinkers, um, among uh, political theorists to make democracy uh, more, uh, you know, suitable to human, uh, you know, for human beings, uh, making, you know, ideas, uh, you know, more effective for democratization of uh, society, democratization of uh, social life and so on and so forth. So, therefore, innovations are happening in both areas, democracy and constitutionalism. And at the same time, attempts are also being made to minimize this, you know, a sphere of tension between the two. Because how to minimize this tension is also important. Because one thing we should remember that both are required for each other. Constitutionalism without democracy has uh, no meaning. And similarly, uh, in fact, uh, uh, democracy without constitutionalism will uh, result into the rule of uh, you know, majority or tyranny of the majority as John Stuart Mill had once said. So therefore, both are important uh, with each other. For example, uh, mere presence of constitution, constitution is no guarantee uh, that a, you know, a rule by constitution will be in place or there will be constitutionalism. Because at the very outset I mentioned that the moment we say constitutionalism, that implies a kind of ideological uh, framework, a value framework, a value, uh, you, know, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a framework through which uh, the rule of law should or the you know, law of the constitution uh, should be operationalized. For example, it is often said that Soviet Union had a constitution, but it did not have uh, constitutionalism uh, because uh, it was a mere constitution, but because of absence of multi-party democracy, absence of uh, you know, people's rights uh, and an independent judiciary, uh, there were many factors uh, which force uh, you know, observers, uh, scholars and the critics to point out that Soviet Union had a constitution but no constitutionalism. 
Now that reminds me of another important statement coming, coming from Thomas Paine when he observed about uh, British system that Britain had uh, a con had constitutionalism without constitution because in opinion of Paine for whom United States of America was ideal type or ideal system so far as constitutionalism is concerned he always thought that constitution that is the written constitution is one of the most important uh, you know prerequisite uh, of, uh, of a, you know a, a sound democratic system and therefore he said that Britain had a constitutionalism because there was a value framework there were values associated or you know tied to that British system for example uh, you know the individual uh, freedom rights and so on and so forth but nonetheless there was no uh, you know constitution written constitution therefore it had a constitutionalism without constitution and on the other hand as I told you uh, as I mentioned that the Soviet Union was called to have a constitution without a constitutionalism so these are some of uh, you know the instances uh, where uh, you know constitution has been uh, you know has been put in place without having a value framework or on the other hand a value framework has been there without a written constitution. So all instances are there but in today's world now it is increasingly realized that for having a sound constitutionalism uh, a discourse of constitutionalism for a value framework uh, for individual freedom for individual rights for autonomy uh, for uh, uh, you know rule based on consent uh, all these things what we require a kind of uh, you know a, a system in which you have a written constitution so on and so forth but still you know Britain does not have a written constitution New Zealand does not have a written constitution but nonetheless it is a general perception. So therefore what I am basically trying to mention here that constitutionalism has been evolving and in modern times we have seen many landmarks and therefore uh, of course when we talk of evolution we, we have to take note of ancient uh, time particularly the Plato and Aristotle which I will refer later and then the Roman period the Polybius and the Cicero and the modern times particularly two pioneers that is Locke and Montesquieu. So these are some of the pioneers in field of you know constitutionalism from ancient to uh, modern time. Of course that does not uh, undermine the significance and importance of many other thinkers who have contributed. Just now I have mentioned Dicey. I have you know one can go on adding many important contributions made by many British uh, constitutional experts uh, and you know and thinkers from uh, both uh, Anglo-Saxon world as well as the continental Europe as well as thinkers from uh, the non-European uh, world of Asia, Africa and Latin America but nonetheless they represent or reflect the major landmarks in the evolution of constitutionalism. Of course when we uh, talk of modern constitutionalism then certain models uh, come to our mind uh, and uh, when we talk of these models all these models uh, represent certain important innovations and important landmarks. One important model is Anglo-Saxon world. In Anglo-Saxon world of course we include both British and the American experiments the two important experiments as it is well known uh, we will discuss later the United States of America was essentially a colony and later on when you know the revolution took place uh, the colonies revolted uh, against their masters and therefore uh, initially these colonies came together and uh, form a confederation in 1777 but later on in a Philadelphia convention uh, you know 1786 uh, 87 what they did that they uh, basically made important modifications and emerged as a federal from confederal to federal system a role model one can say from the point of view of federal system of governance or a federal theory so therefore this is the American and uh, you know particularly part of this Anglo-Saxon but of course the most important uh, you know model is of course the British model uh, which is known as uh, you know the mother of parliament British parliament is considered mother of parliament because it is uh, in fact uh, perhaps uh, the first important uh, instance of a parliamentary form of government the parliamentary sovereignty of course within a kind of titular monarch the monarchy 
uh, basically titular monarchy, the kind of democracy uh, which is uh, based on the concept of parliamentary sovereignty. But a judiciary like United States of America is not given the power to review the laws and acts of the constitution. So therefore, in fact, this Britain and United States of America are the two examples of this Anglo-Saxon world. Then we come to the continental Europe and the continental European model one can say. And here we have many instances from France to Switzerland, Germany and so on and so forth. So therefore there are many uh, you know, variations within this continental uh, you know, European model. Of course the two uh, systems which are often referred, one is this French, another is the Swiss because Swiss model uh, is important from the point of view of certain new innovations, particularly in the era of democracy, how it has tried to combine the experiments and the innovations uh, for realizing uh, people's will through a constitutional design, particularly innovations like, uh, you know, recall and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, other mechanisms through which the system of direct democracy has been institutionalized. So that is continental European model. Then you have commonwealth model and commonwealth model uh, you have uh, those countries who at one point of time were colonies of Britain and later on gained independence and they have uh, evolved their own system which is to great extent one can say is a combination of American and British system but at the same time many new innovations. For example, the best example here is Canada uh, followed by Australia and then of course uh, you know one cannot forget today the Indian innovations and Indian experiment which is considered to be uh, novel in terms of many innovative ideas which we'll uh, mention later particularly from, from the point of view of, view of group rights, uh, from the point of view of a multicultural constitution, from the point of view of certain institutional innovations and so on and so forth in spite of the fact that it was drawing heavily on the Canadian system because that was the first commonwealth uh, constitution uh, drafted by uh, the British uh, imperial power. So that is the commonwealth model. And then the next model of course is the socialist model and here of course uh, one is reminded of erstwhile Soviet Union, the Soviet model uh, about which I mentioned that it was said that Soviet Union had a constitution without constitutionalism because there was no bare value framework uh, which is associated with constitutionalism. On the other hand we have the China. So these two are the important uh, you know, representations of the socialist model. But then there are many critiques uh, who believe that uh, you know, the socialist model cannot be uh, considered as an example of constitutionalism because of the normative framework through which constitutionalism expresses itself was totally absent in these socialist countries. And finally, the third world countries as a whole, which of course include India, but then there are many countries of Asia, Africa and Latin America and they had their own experiment and their own uh, you know, experiences uh, in terms of this uh, evolution of constitutionalism. Thank <music> you.
fact, this uh, evolution of constitutionalism and democracy uh, is something uh, very interesting from the point of view of evolution of ideas as well. That how uh, you know the ideas have evolved, uh, resulting out of you know various experiences and experiments in history, and accordingly, the two you know two domains of uh, you know uh, of human. Uh, you know, history, human, human society have been enriched. One is democracy, another is constitutionalism. Of course, both are different, but at the same time, both have uh, important interfaces, and therefore, both have to grow together. Because if democracy as people's power, as a will of the people, the sovereign will of the people is important, then at the same time, uh, a limitation on that sovereign will is equally important. Because if there is no limitation, if there is no checkmating of that sovereign will, then that sovereign will at times can also become detrimental for human uh, evolution and human growth. So, therefore, that sovereign will has to be kept in check. And constitutionalism is basically an idea, uh, you know, which basically uh, tells us that how that check has been understood and how that check has been theorized and, uh, you know, and has been put in place over uh, the years and over the ages. Now, of course, this evolution as I was mentioning earlier also of both constitutionalism and democracy uh, you know is traced back to ancient Greek period. And the two names which are very important here from the point of view of this evolution, uh, one is of course uh, Plato, another is Aristotle. Now, of course, uh, Greek heritage uh, you know when we talk of Greek heritage, one thing is important. Uh, that in Greek period, uh, you know, this uh, there was no concept of a limited government. Uh, in fact, in Athens, uh, there was no theory of limited government at all or separation of public and private. Life was understood in more holistic terms, in terms of the community, uh, you know, uh, life of the people. And therefore, uh, in fact, we find uh, that in that given situation, the Greek thinkers were uh, reflecting on uh, both constitution and democracy. Of course, Plato did not think of much of a uh, constitution and constitutional rule. In fact, the ideal system which he envisioned was uh, based on the rule of the philosopher, because philosophy in opinion or in, uh, you know, in Plato's uh, you know, uh, mind was something which was more unifying than the constitution, which could be divisive. And therefore, he talked of the rule of a philosopher, philosopher king in his uh, republic, ideal republic. Uh, but of course, he modified to some extent his ideas in his subsequent writings, particularly laws. But nonetheless, in republic, the ideal uh, system which he drew was essentially a non-constitutional, non-legal, not based on rules and regulations. On the other hand, his disciple Aristotle uh, basically gives altogether a different uh, impression. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned earlier also, uh, that uh, it is not just for nothing that he is considered father of political science. Because many uh, ideas about institutions, rules, about regulations, about constitution, about many other uh, institutional protocol, uh, you know, is traced back to Aristotle, in, including his civic republicanism and so on and so forth. So, in fact, Aristotle, who studied 158 constitutions, existing constitutions of that period, and on basis of that, he tried to draw a picture of what ideal constitution and ideal law. Uh, particularly, he believed that law, rule of law, rule by law is always preferable than the rule of any one tyrant or any one individual. Because Aristotle thought because law, in his opinion, implied impersonal, uh, you know, rule, and therefore that would also imply, uh, you know, absence of arbitrary, uh, you know, uh, rule and arbitrary uh, judgments, and therefore it would enforce a fair and uh, you know a reasonable system of uh, governments. So therefore, in fact, compared to rule by one person, uh, you know, Aristotle thought it is always preferable to have a rule by law and law by the constitution. And therefore, one can say that this is the beginning of, uh, you know, the Greek realization that how constitution and constitutionalism are important. It is a different matter that 
scholars on would may, may would, they would may you know they may say uh, that you know still there was uh, no constitution discourse on constitutionalism because i mentioned earlier also that there is a difference between mere presence of constitution and the presence of constitution along with a normative framework of values uh, you know uh, which basically govern the constitution and that is constitutionalism so therefore this was the beginning of the realization of the importance of a rule by the constitution and therefore aristotle's contribution here is very important in fact uh, when aristotle talked about rule you know constitutional rule he meant three things first that this rule will be in the interest of the common people or it will be in the common interest secondly it will be ruled through regulation and not through decrees and the third that it will be ruled based on consent and not force and therefore he thought that con rule constitutional rule would always be preferable uh, you know to any other uh, sort of rule which uh, may be a tyrannical rule now uh, of course aristotle classified the government on basis of two criteria uh, that is his classification of government that who rules and who gets benefit out of that rule on these two basis he classified government about both normal and perverted uh, democracy polity all you know tyranny oligarchy and so on and so many classifications and out of that classification six fold classifications are uh, you know emerged but one thing is very important that he was very critical of democracy because democracy in his opinion was a perverted form of uh, rule by many uh, because uh, you know it it had no uh, limitation and therefore he preferred a uh, polity compared to democracy it was a moderate form of uh, rule by uh, many now of course so far his ideal uh, the system is concerned aristotle settled for a mixed constitution a mixed constitution in which there would be features of aristocracy and uh, democracy both with government of course would be run by the middle class and middle class in fact in his scheme of things uh, would be the mean between the rich and the you know poor because rich on the one hand poor on the other hand middle class is standing in between therefore it would uh you know uh you know it would uh, suggest a mean of the two things the two extremes so therefore the golden mean one can say uh you know a famous golden mean of aristotle combining the two one can say in indian uh, parlance that a madhyam mark so therefore this uh, you know the mixed constitution combining aristocracy and democratic elements and thereby combining the best of the two and uh, you know basically suggesting a mean between the uh you know golden mean between uh, the rich and the poor and therefore ruled by the middle class so this dictum has continued basically this observation is still carries value today that how many thinkers uh, many scholars who have worked on democracy uh, from dal and others have also given importance to such system of government uh in fact this is how uh, you know they try to uh, you know give importance to elites uh in the governance of the society out of which this entire elitist theory of democracy has emerged so therefore what uh, you know we should remember that aristotle made important contribution deviating from the standard uh, tradition of the greek thinking and the greek uh, you know uh, you know practices and therefore he talked about a rule by the constitution rule by constitution because in his opinion it was any day preferable to rule by one tyrant of course then after greek we have had this roman period uh, which is also important uh, because uh, roman people on, and the roman thinkers made important innovations in area of administration in area of rule of law in area of secret ballot and uh, for example who can forget uh, the name uh, like cicero the who you know gave important ideas about uh, inst roman institutions and so on and so forth so therefore even in the roman period we find uh, that this entire uh, constitutional uh, discourse as constitutionalism uh, taking a from uh, you know shape and or, or one can say a evolutionary moving on this evolutionary track along with this idea of democracy because all of them also made important contribution for realizing uh the vision of a democratic social order whether it is uh you know the innovative ideas in area of administration or rule of law or for the method of election and so on and so forth so therefore one can say that cicero polybius and subsequently in mid medieval period aquinas uh you know of course the early modern machiavelli all of them 
uh, you know made important contributions and to some extent one can say uh, that Machiavelli also popularized this idea of mixed constitution uh, you know the way we are talking in context of Aristotle. So, therefore, in fact uh, this ancient and medieval period we have seen that this evolution of constitutionalism and democracy uh, you know was taking a very definite direction uh, you know uh, to the extent that in modern times. Uh, when thinkers have started reflecting on the challenges of the time. Uh, for example, the social contract theorists like uh, Locke and Rousseau, they were not basically reflecting vacuum, but they had basically they were carrying uh, you know whole host of ideas which were handed down to them from uh, this history. But nonetheless, their innovations and their contributions were basically novel in certain respects because they tried to come out with certain ideas which were unparalleled in great you know many respects uh, you know in history. So, therefore, this modern period begins, but before we come to this modern period we should also mention as I uh, mentioned earlier also that it was not only the Greek thinkers or the Roman thinkers who had basically struggled with these ideas. Even in India we find that ancient Indian uh, thinkers had uh, you know contributed handsomely on this issue. For example, uh, Cortelius particularly his Arthasas, though it is book on Arthasas, the title is Arthasas, but it is uh, equally a reflection rather more a reflection on the system of government administration and so on and so forth. So, therefore, in fact on the state, so far as evolution of a state is concerned, Indian thinkers equally uh, reflected on it. But at the same time we should also remember that India is considered to be a country which cradle uh, the first republican form of government in ancient times. Of course, the republican system was superseded by monarchical system and for and after that for many many years there was no uh, you know uh, indication uh, of any uh, democratic uh, system uh, functioning here till uh, you know India uh, you know got colonized and a certain new awakening started. So, therefore, this is uh, something significant that both in the west as well as in the east in both in civilizational terms one can say uh, that these ideas were uh, growing uh, in terms of democracy and constitutionalism. But when you come to modern time we can really uh, feel that how a revolutionary break is taking place because modern time is a modern period is also known as period of revolutions. We have had number of revolutions uh, taking place in this period and the most important revolution from the point of view of constitutionalism and democracy 1688 glorious revolution of Britain. But along with American war of independence and the French revolution are another major landmarks in our history in modern history. So, far as the revolution modern revolution is concerned. Of course, uh, Fredericks when he reflects and when he talks of roots of constitutionalism, uh, he associates constitutionalism in modern times with five important values. Uh, one is liberalism, another is rationalism, third is individualism, fourth is capitalism and of course, fifth is imperialism. But nonetheless, one should also uh, remember here that apart from you know these five values, there are whole host of other factors which have contributed toward the growth of both constitutionalism and democracy. Now, of course, the national unification uh, which started uh, in modern times particularly after the Treaty of Westphalia 1648 is considered very important uh, you know phenomenon of modern history which basically contributed uh, towards uh, the consolidation of state power and therefore, the moment a state power was consolidated then a realization was uh, you know a realization dawned upon the people that this consolidated sovereign power of the state may be detrimental to the people's rights, people's freedom and therefore, that has to be curtailed or that has to be checkmated uh, within law and that is perhaps the basis on which this uh, concept of limited government. Uh, emerged. In fact, along with this there was another realization that human nature is not perfect. This imperfect in you know this realization about the imperfectness of human nature was another in important contributory factor in the growth of this concept of limited government. Because the moment it is believed that human nature is imperfect then that uh, that nature can result into certain deviations or deviant behavior which can be detrimental to uh, you know human uh, society and therefore, there has to be certain institutional checks 
on the possibility of such deviant behavior. And therefore, this limited government through checks and balances, through institutional designs are basically uh, the product of such realization about the imperfect, imperfectness of human uh, you know, behavior, human nature. Now, Montesquieu, uh, in fact, as it is considered, he is considered to be, uh, you know, the pioneer or the father of this concept of separation of power doctrine, uh, you know, checks and balances and separation of power, where the three organs of the government, legislature and executive and judiciary, have to be separate and different. Now, who is, he is considered the father of this doctrine, the separation of power, who interestingly, uh, you know, studied British system and declared British system to be based on this idea of separation of power. But he wrongly read it because fact of the matter is that this separation of power doctrine did not apply to British system, but rather it American system, uh, you know, and therefore, uh, in fact, American system is based on this Montesquieu separation of power. But, you know, it is also at times believed that Montesquieu only reiterated a Lockean idea of separation of power. Because he, uh, you know, before Montesquieu, Locke had already, through his contract theory, uh, through his concept of limited government and the government based on consent, uh, had already, uh, you know, given, uh, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, blueprint or a kind of framework for this separation of power doctrine and checks and balances. So, this is how we find that the ideas of thinkers have influenced and shaped the, you know, the broad contours of uh, institutional history of democracy or one can say the evolution of institutions of uh, modern democracy. Now, of course, uh, the, uh, on, on basis of this evolution, uh, as I mentioned earlier that the four, five different models have emerged in the world and all models have certain uniqueness and certain commonness. Now, first is the Anglo-Saxon world, the one model which includes, uh, you know, the, the Anglo-Saxon would include British and the American. The next is the continental, the third is the commonwealth, uh, which includes Canada, Australia, India, New Zealand and so on and so forth. The socialist, that is Soviet Union, erstwhile Soviet Union and China and the third world countries, which includes many African, Latin American and Asian countries. So, these are the different models uh, of, uh, you know, constitutionalism which have emerged. Now, of course, the two models which are very important and they are the Anglo-Saxon model one can say, but with a lot of differences. But in terms of inspiration, they have left, a, you know, a great, you know, influence on the subsequent uh, innovations and subsequent experiments in history. One is the British, another is, of course, the American. To begin with the British system. Now, the British system is itself very interesting because the British system, uh, you know, as it is uh, known, is based on parliamentary form of government. The parliamentary form of government where you do not have uh, you know, a judiciary uh, reviewing the acts of parliament. Of course, since there is no written constitution, therefore no review of constitution is uh, possible. But even the acts of parliament, because parliament is sovereign, it is often said that British parliament is so sovereign that it can, it can do anything on earth except turning a man into woman or woman into man. This is a famous statement of Ramsay Muir, one of the authorities on British constitution. So, therefore, this system based on parliamentary sovereignty uh, along with the system of rule of law. Of course, in absence of a written constitution, the British system is based on customary laws and common laws. Uh, and therefore, it is uh, altogether a different system. And it is here that Dices, as another important uh, you know, thinker, contributor in terms of evolution of democracy and constitutionalism. His concept of rule of law is equally important because in Dicey's rule of law has three important components. The first is the rule of law uh, will be the exclusion of arbitrary rule. Basically, it will be rule of uh, the rules and regulations by law. No arbitrariness, rather fairness and transparency. The number two is equality before law that everyone is equal before law, however high or mighty one may be, but so far as law is concerned, uh, he or she has to be treated equally. And the third is the remedies available uh, by the ordinary law in that system. Not any extraordinary law is required for, uh, you know, seeking remedies. So, therefore, remedies by ordinary law. So, three important features of rule of law as theorized by Dicey. They are the cornerstone of this uh, British system of 
you know constitutionalism interestingly as i mentioned earlier also that you know thomas pen once said that britain had constitutionalism but no constitution because in his opinion for having uh, constitutionalism sound constitutionalism constitution uh, a written constitution was one of the important precondition but britain didn't have a written constitution but nonetheless that normative framework which implies constitutionalism was always there so therefore britain is one of the classic case of constitutionalism you know in modern times and that has influenced whole host of other experiments in history including the commonwealth model which i was referring to the canada australia india and so on and so forth so this britain the british constitution or one can say that this british constitutionalism along with the british representative democracy are two important uh, innovations in uh, human history which have enriched this area that is constitutionalism and uh, democracy now of course the from the, after british system the another important landmark was achieved in united states of america now that is equally important now united states of america as a model uh, you know because is important because of certain innovations which americans made particularly in terms of separation of power uh, in terms of checks and balances of uh, federalism a uh, bill of rights a uh, judicial review and so on and so forth and all of them can be considered uh, very innovative from the point of view of constitutionalism now of course usa was a colony of britain uh, in fact one can say that uh, when i was talking about britain one, one one should remember that how the major turbulence in britain started uh, in you know 16th century particularly during uh, the reign, reign of james 1 but 1566 to 1625 because it was james who asserted divine rights of the king to rule in 1610 and that uh, result, resulted into a uh, lot of uh, you know turmoil and lot of turbulence and therefore in opposition to this jamesian declaration of divine rights that we find that subsequently social contract theory uh, get you know gaining ground in uh, british Uh, politics british society and among british thinkers and the social contract theory became a new weapon to fight uh, this autocratic monarchical rule of uh, you know britain now this is how the constitutional state was envisioned in britain now of course there are many important landmarks from the point of view of democracy as well as constitutional rule in britain also if if we consider that people's rights fundamental rights as one of the important limitation Uh, on you know the tyranny of the majority and also one of the important limitation on the tyranny of the ruler then one can say that britain is also pioneer here because the magna carta of 1215 uh, you know which was a very important development at that time not still modern uh, late medieval uh, one can say that this magna carta through magna carta the rights were granted to barons and the free citizens and the subsequent in 1628 when the petition of rights came into existence and finally 1688 when bill of rights was enacted so therefore uh, these things you know these things prepared the ground for lockean liberalism uh, in you know britain but when you come to the american system uh, what we find that is american model unlike the british model was revolutionary it was not evolutionary like britain and this revolutionary model was based on a very important development in history that is american war of independence when 13 colonies uh, revolted and waged war against uh, the crown and this is the beginning of a new revolution in history and it was not only revolution uh, in terms of historical changes but it was a revolution in terms of the transformation and transition th- through towards new ideas so far as constitutionalism is concerned now of course uh, the most important uh, con- you know revolution revolutionary uh, development which took place in terms of ideas was uh, you know the creation of a new form of government known as a federal form of government because if we remember uh, that 1648 we had this uh, treaty of westphalia and the state system nation state which emerged or the state system which emerged after treaty of westphalia uh, had certain characteristics one was that you know unified sovereignty of the state 
And I, as I mentioned earlier, that unified sovereignty also contributed towards the growth of constitutional ideas and constitutionalism. But what happened in United States of America was another form of revolution. That was a federal revolution. Therefore, normally in terms of the evolution of a state and constitutionalism, many scholars make a distinction between Westphalian model and the federal model. Because Westphalian model is based on unified sovereign authority, whereas the federal model is based on a division of sovereign uh, authority. So therefore, this federalism emerging in United States in 1787 uh, in a Philadelphia convention uh, and the debate which happened at that time between the federalist and anti-federalist is something very significant from the point of view of uh, you know the evolution of constitu constitutionalism along with federalism we have had this separation of power of Lockean and Montesquian type then the bill of rights of course taking some shape in Britain through this Magna Carta, Petition of Rights, etc., etc., but first for the first time getting constitutionalized United States of America in this through this first 10 amendments. How these 10 amendments, first 10 amendments had to be brought into the constitution is another interesting part of this story. And then having a Senate at the federal chamber, upper chamber, along with this famous doctrine of judicial review uh, as propounded by Marshall. So these are the important innovative landmarks so far as the second model in this constitutionalism is concerned that is uh, United States of America. But then of course there are other models like commonwealth, third world and so on and so forth. But for the time being we should understand that how Britain and United States have contributed significantly in the growth of both democracy and constitutionalism. Dear friends, due to paucity of, of time, we have to stop a lecture here. On that note, we would like to thank Dr. Satish Kumar Jha for coming to our show and delivering this wonderful lecture. And thank you, dear friends, for watching our lecture. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.